You know, actually, uh, uh, it's uh, difficult because, uh, you know, uh, we are opening our economy and we are still being on the pandemic uh, racing curve. Uh, and then, so that is a major problem. You know, with uh, people, the business people against the medical doctors and public health experts. What is the uh, best way to solve the economic and health problems? That is uh, our main concern at this moment. Yeah. We are just having 40, you know, looks like we are having 40,000 cases, but uh, we believe that is about uh, uh, almost a half million people because, you know, uh, sub-registry of, of, of this problem. Uh, but uh, the main concern is, uh, you know, the, the next months. And we are just hoping that the vaccine will come. You know? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> In India also, we are racing, getting a lot of patients and uh, the tally is uh, rising. Uh, you know, still no hope of any plateau reaching the plateau. What is the situation there, uh, Vivek, in uh, the institute? Well, it is rising. Sir. Our institute is the corona hospital for our region. And, uh, you know, the cases are rising. You know, they're yeah. on the ascendant. So, like everywhere else in India, of course, the rise is not so exponential as it is in other parts of India. Yeah. It's a little, uh, I would say, mitigated. But still, it is on the ascendant. You know? Yeah. So we are also hoping for the vaccine. We are just saying that the vaccine comes sooner than later. Yeah. The whole world is doing that. Yes. In Brazil, you know, there are at least four vaccines that have been implemented in phase three. The uh, Oxford vaccine and then the, uh, the two Chinese uh, vaccines. Uh, and so initially they will start with uh, in healthcare providers, medical doctors, and so on. So we will have the data in the next, I believe, two two months or so, three. Yeah. We, uh, we are working also with the Solidarity Project, with the WHO. Yeah. Yes, India is working, and us also. There are 21 countries working on, yeah. on Solidarity. Keeping our fingers crossed, you know, at the moment. Yep. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, we John, are. Situation in... there. How is the situation there, Professor John? Oh, it's still quite a terrible problem in many states, including Louisiana. And like Marco said, it's always the business people fighting with the public health officials about how to handle it. <laughs> So we are waiting on the vaccine too. And the, the other one besides the Oxford and AstraZeneca that seems to be going along well is the Moderna, which is actually yeah. the messenger RNA vaccine. Right. And so I'm hopeful that one of those or both of those will be available early next year. Yep. The Moderna technique is quite fascinating because you know they're actually using the messenger RNA to transcribe the spike protein. Amazing. You know, they, you are at this moment using the, okay. Uh, so we're just sharing the program. You can continue uh, the talk, not a problem. Yeah. Uh, we have approximately 90 participants. Yeah, 100 now. They, are, they will join soon. So in another two minutes, we'll start. Uh, Dr. Sudhir Kothari or Dr. Gagandip has joined, Pansi. No, sir. None of them have joined. Do you want me to call them up? Uh, yeah. Uh, Kothari has joined. Dr. Kothari has joined. Yeah, I have. Uh, hello, Dr. England. Hello, Dr. Medina. And uh, yes. Hi. So people hello. keep joining. I think once you start, they will keep coming.
I didn't know that uh, we had Zika in India also. Yeah, yeah in uh, in Gujarat, uh, about two years back, uh, in 2018, that we had uh, some cases of Zika. Another, uh, in some, some cases in Tamil Nadu. So now we've, I think, gone to 110. Maybe you can... Yeah. Uh, Sudhir, should we start? Gagan is... Uh, I think you can start. Gagan will join. Okay. Okay. Uh, dear friends, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, buenas dias, bonjour. Welcome to this third session of WFN Fine Neuro Infection Series. Today on the board, we have speaker, Professor Marco Medina, my friend. As chairperson, we have Professor Christopher Kennard and uh, Professor John England. And in the panel, we have Professor Vivek Lal, Dr. Anita Mahadevan will soon join, Dr. Raju Soman, the w fine trustees, Dr. Sudhir Kothari is here, and others will join soon. So I welcome you all. In this session, we are very fortunate to have Professor Chris Kennard to chair this session. He is currently Emeritus Professor and Head, Newfield Department of Clinical Neurosciences, University of Oxford, UK. After his neurology training, he was consultant neurologist at Royal London Hospital. Before his present position, he also served as Deputy Principal of the Faculty of Medicine and Head of Department of Clinical Neuroscience at Empirical College London. He also played a role as a Chairman of the MRC's Neuroscience, Neuroscience and Mental Health Board. Health. His President, Association of British Neurologists, in 2000, from 2003 to 2005. He also served as president European Neuro Ophthalmology Society. He was editor of the, the prestigious JNNP for six years. He has researched extensively in cognitive neuroscience and visual sciences, and he's currently the chair of scientific program committee of World Congress of Neurology, Dubai and Rome. Welcome, Professor uh, Chris Kennard. Thank you very much. Other chair, we have Professor John England. He's professor of professor and chair of neurology, School of Medicine, Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center, New Orleans, Louisiana. He plays important role in different capacities in World Federation of Neurology. John is currently Chair of the Task Force on Zika Virus for WFN and WHO with focus on neurological complications. He is Editor-in-Chief of Journal of Neurological Sciences, which is a publication of World Federation of Neurology. He is Chair of the Publication and Communications Committee of WFN. He is President of Neuromuscular Disorders Specialty Group of WFN. Chair, American Board of Electrodiagnostic Medicine. Had many awards and honors. The important one was in 2016 as Distinguished Physician Award, American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine. He's on editorial board as a consultant for more than 20 journals, 
and has more than 300 publications. Welcome, Professor John England. Yeah, Dr. Meshram, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, as you know, and we have declared uh, previously that this uh, series we have dedicated to Professor J.S. Chopra. And I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Vivek Lal, who is currently uh, professor and head department of neurology at PJMER Chandigarh is with us in the panel. Welcome, Professor Vivek Lal. Thank you, and sir. I'll, Thank you for inviting Dr. me. Uh, Anita Mahadevan has also joined. She is a professor of neuropathology at uh, uh, Nimans. Uh, welcome, Professor Anita. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. And, uh, Raju the Soman will also soon join. Now I hand over uh, to yeah. carry out the Adi, Adi Manji is also joining. Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Hadi, Adi Manji, welcome uh, to the session. Thank you for Thank being you. with us. Bye. And uh, you'll be there uh, next week also. Thank you, welcome. And uh, now I hand over the uh, for further proceedings uh, to Professor John England and Professor Chris Kennard. Thank Dr. Meshram, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to be part of this distinguished group. And it's a particular pleasure of mine to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Marco Medina. Dr. Medina is professor of neurology and epilepsy, former dean, the faculty of medical sciences of the National Autonomous University of Honduras in Tegucigalpa, the director of the World Health Organization, Collaborating Center for Research and Community Intervention in Epilepsy. He also serves as the World Federation of Neurology Regional Director for Latin America. He's been the president of the Pan American Federation of Neurological Societies and notably was a co founder of that organization. He established in 1992 a genetic research consortium. He's the founding president of the ILAE chapter in Honduras and the ILAE Latin American Academy of Epilepsy. He has many areas of expertise and interest, including neurology, tropical neurology and public health, epileptology, clinical neurophysiology and genetics. And I've known Marco for many years now, and I can attest to the fact that he not only has these areas of interest, he's an expert in all of them. He's had many honors, including as an epilepsy ambassador and was recognized by the government of France. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Medina, who today is going to give us our featured talk on Zika and other arboviruses. So, with that introduction, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Medina. Thank you. Uh, Professor Medina, we are not able to hear you. You will have to unmute yourself. Yes, it's a great honor. Uh, to be with you today uh, and uh, to participate in this important educational activity uh, of the uh, World Federation of Neurology Tropical and Geographical Neurology Speciality Group that, uh, and that has been also supported by the Forum for Indian uh, Neurology Education. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Professor Chandri Shakar Meshran, uh, who is the actual president of, of this uh, specialty group, and as well as uh, uh, Professor John England. Uh, Professor John England has been uh, our chairman of the WFNCA group, uh, and I, uh, it's a great honor that he's a, the co-chair of this session, as well as Professor Christopher Kennard, uh, so uh, I will give today a, a lecture on uh, one of the topics that uh, uh, we believe uh, are 
quite important uh, regionally, but also worldwide, uh, which is the neurologic consequences of Zika and other arbovirus infections, uh, mainly dengue and chikungunya. Uh, I would like to uh, highlight some uh, words for uh, uh, our friend, Professor Hamilton Barreira, who was the former WFM a Tropical uh, and uh, Geographical Neurology Speciality Group who died uh, recently. And also for Professor Chopra, who was a very close friend of, of Latin America. I don't, I don't have anything to disclosure in this lecture. And uh, the main uh, goal of this uh, uh, session will be understanding the spectrum of neurologic consequences of arbovirus infection, mainly Zika, and as well as chikungunya and dengue. As we know, uh, the term arbovirus includes several families of RNA viruses that are spread by arthropods, vectors, most commonly mosquitoes, ticks, and sand flies. The families of viruses uh, include, included in the arbovirus group are the Flaviviridae, Togaviridae, Bungaviridae, and Reoviridae uh, families. Uh, the main examples of these arbovirus infections are obviously Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya, as well as California encephalitis, Eastern equine encephalitis, San Luis encephalitis, West Nile, yellow fever, among others. Uh, one of the problems with these uh, arthropod-borne uh, viruses, uh, the arbovirus, is the neurotropic ones uh, that preferentially infect neurons of the central nervous systems or even the peripheral uh, nervous systems uh, with a different mechanism and belongs to several different positive and negative sense RNA viruses families. Uh, the clinically rele uh, relevant neurotropic arbovirus uh, include a Flaviviridae a virus, of, uh, for example, West Nile virus or San Luis encephalitis virus or Japanese encephalitis. The Bunja virus is a virus like La Crosse in California and the New World Alpha viruses like uh, the Eastern, Western, and Venezuelan equine encephalitis viruses, and as we know recently, chikungunya, uh, dengue, and Zika. As uh, Professor John England uh, usually highlight, uh, the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are the uh, uh, most dangerous animal in the world. You can see here a picture of this uh, mosquitoes and the regions of the world that are affected by these mosquitoes, mainly in uh, Mesoamerica, uh, Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean region, as well as uh, uh, a part of uh, Florida, and then in Latin America, mainly in Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, and Brazil. And the Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the uh, obviously India, uh, the south part of, uh, uh, of Asia, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia. But as you can see in yellow, uh, the countries uh, are also affected uh, uh, due to the climate change, uh, especially the south part of the United States, California, Europe, Spain, uh, France, Italy, uh, as well as uh, China, and in the south part of, of uh, America, uh, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, and uh, other countries around the world. Uh, so the climate change is a, will produce a, 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 a higher frequency uh, uh, of uh, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus around the world. And this is a picture of this, uh, uh, this problem that will increase in the next uh, decades. 
Um, so I would like to start with uh, the Zika viruses. As we know, in uh, uh, 2016, the World Health Organization declared Zika virus as a global public health emergency uh, based on the cluster of microcephalic cases that were identified in Brazil, mainly in the Pernambuco area, as well as the cluster of Guillain-Barré syndrome in the French Polynesia. Uh, right after uh, this uh, declaration, the WFN and Professor Rachakir appointed uh, Professor John England and a uh, WFN Zika working group starting uh, to evaluate uh, this major problem among the uh, neurology community around the world. So we started uh, with Professor uh, John England and others a, a, a global and regional uh, response uh, on this uh, subject. And, and you can see here several uh, lectures, uh, for instance, Professor John England here in, in a, our School of Medicine with 4,000 students uh, listening about uh, Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya. Zika was, uh, was identified in, uh, initially in Uganda in 1947. Uh, was isolated from monkeys in, uh, and uh, from Aedes africanus mosquitoes in 1948. Uh, Zika virus uh, uh, genotype, there are two main uh, genotypes. One is the African genotype, and the second one is the um, Asian genotype. And you can see the mutation of the Asian uh, uh, genotype and this one represent the initial mutations in the oceanic area and then uh, in uh, Brazil and then in the Caribbean region and then the United States, Central America and Mexico uh, with different mutations coming from this Asian uh, genotype. Uh, and this Asian genotype uh, uh, has a very high neurotrophic uh, uh, findings. Uh, the initial uh, report of uh, this uh, uh, Zika Asian uh, genotype is, uh, was published in uh, the Jap Island uh, where uh, they reported uh, uh, 31 cases uh, having macular or papular rash, fever, arthritis, arthralgia, non-purulent conjunctivitis, myalgia, headache, retroorbital uh, affectation and, and, and pain, edema, vomiting. You can see here a case of a non purulent conjunctivitis uh, that uh, is uh, quite frequent in patients having sick. And this is the macular papular rash of uh, people having uh, sick. So uh, the, ex the spectrum of neurological consequences of Zika, we can identify, first of all, the congenital Zika syndrome by affecting the neuronal stem cells of human fetal brain, the Guillain-Barré syndrome uh, that can be associated to the autoimmune response against peripheral myelin and our axonal components or a probable direct inflammatory reaction. Also, we can see acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and optic neuropathy, seizures and epilepsy, mainly on the congenital Zika syndrome, the uh, childhood uh, arterial ischemic stroke uh, by a probable inflammatory reaction and endothelial injury, so initially, uh, the outbreak uh, in Brazil was identified uh, uh, in uh, the in Pernambuco, which is uh, is a, a, a this spot uh, in the corner of, of Brazil, at uh, the equatorial area, and you can see the frequency of microcephaly between uh, 2000. Uh, 10, 2014 versus 2015, that was a major 
uh, problem there. And then the rest of the Latin American countries started having this uh, similar uh, problem. So by 2017, the World Health Organization estimated that nearly 100 million people and more than 1 million pregnant women in the Americas were infected, suggesting that tens of thousands of children were having congenital Zika syndrome. Uh, and uh, the main concern was the no microcephalic infant uh, uh, that uh, explain a, a, a kind of iceberg scenario. This is one of the first cases that were uh, identified in evaluating the neuropathological finding. Uh, and you can see the viruses in the, in the brain of a fetus. Uh, uh, recently, uh, a different evaluation of the differential responses of human fetal brain neuro neural stem cells on Zika virus syndrome has been identified as a, the, uh, one of the main mechanisms uh, of uh, this virus affecting uh, these stem cells. And you can see a, a patient uh, from Brazil uh, having uh, the microcephaly, the cutis girata, as well the arthrogryposis in arms and, and legs. And the brain malformation with a severe a uh, pachygeria or lysencephalic feature, as well as calcification and, and uh, is a uh, abnormal corpus callosum, uh, plus a, a reduction in the, uh, uh, the brain stem or the cerebellum region. So uh, these uh, uh, children uh, can have this cutis girata, uh, as well as uh, a ophthalmic abnormalities and orthopedic abnormalities, among other uh, problems. Uh, but uh, this virus, as we know, can also directly infect the peripheral neurons. Uh, this is a Honduran patient uh, of two years old that I was evaluating uh, uh, and the mother and the father were medical doctors that uh, had, uh, the mother had uh, the, uh, when she was pregnant at three months, uh, Zika virus. And you can see here uh, this uh, baby uh, having a spastic uh, quadriparetic posture uh, with a, a very small head. Uh, the mother was concerned that this patient was having hypoacusia. We evaluated the VOC potential and were completely normal. Uh, this patient uh, was uh, having a, a profound uh, mental psychomotor uh, retardation. And this is the MRI of this uh, child, a three Tesla MRI. You can see here, uh, you know, the vermis is very small. The brain stem and, and is almost lysencephalic uh, and it's asymmetric, asymmetric um, uh, enlargement of the ventricle, uh, ventricles. Uh, so uh, this is one issue. The second issue is about the Zika virus uh, that affected the peripheral neurons. Uh, there are several studies uh, showing that in, in the mouse, uh, the, the Zika can infect and impact the peripheral neuron in vivo, uh, and also uh, affecting the stem cells, derived human neural crest cells and peripheral neurons in vitro, leading to the increased cell deaths, transcriptional dysregulation and cell type specific molecular pathology. So uh, Zika virus, in, uh, Infection uh, can cause this substantial cell death and this pathogenic transcription of this regulation. In uh, the French uh, Polynesia, uh, Lao Carmo uh, published this paper on the uh, Guillain Barre syndrome outbreak associated with Zika. Uh, here, uh, in 
you can see the outbreak of Zika in red, the outbreak of uh, Guillain Barre. It's almost at the same time and uh, with uh, different uh, uh, glycolipids uh, uh, that were identified in these uh, patients. Here you can see the uh, then in, in Latin America, in different countries, for instance, in Dominican Republic, uh, in Venezuela, Honduras, uh, where we started at the end of uh, 2015, uh, a, the outbreak of uh, Zika plus the outbreak of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, and uh, we e e evaluated uh, several cases in, in, in our uh, hospital. Uh, Professor John England was part of this paper in, in Honduras where 17% of patients with Guillain-Barre was associated with uh, arbovirus and the main uh, arbovirus uh, was a Zika, and the second one uh, associated the Guillain-Barre virus uh, was chikungunya. And uh, was, uh, you know, the, the uh, symptomatology uh, started uh, almost at the same time uh, in a sequential phase uh, uh, with uh, the Zika, uh, infection and the Guillain-Barre syndrome. So we think that could be a direct uh, a, um, affectation of the, of the nerve by the Zika virus. This is a paper from Colombia published at the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Parra and Dr. Uh, Prado. Uh, they evaluated uh, uh, here the, the frequency of uh, Guillain-Barre and in this table, uh, you can see the uh, clinical symptomatology, the most frequent type of Guillain-Barre according with this report in more than 60 cases was the acute uh, inflammatory demyelinating uh, polyneuropathy and the second one was the AMAN. Uh, in 2016, when uh, Professor John England uh, was visiting uh, Honduras, we evaluated a case that happened to be the first uh, sensory polyneuropathy case uh, associated to Zika. Uh, this case that we evaluated uh, with Professor John England was a 62 years old male Honduran Italian uh, that uh, was neurologically evaluated initially in Venezuela, uh, having uh, uh, in Venezuela a erythematous uh, papular rash and a mild fever. Uh, and he was experiencing in intense pruritus on chest, abdomen, upper and lower limbs and that lasted for four years. And, and then uh, uh, the patient was out having a remarkable hy hypoalgesia in growth stocking pattern. And the nerve conduction story showing was showing a reduction of velocity on the left sural nerve. We, we evaluated uh, uh, the uh, uh, serological test and uh, was positive for Zika virus. Uh, we, so, then a uh, different report started uh, on, uh, on the literature, and then we see the first case of the acute uh, disseminated encephalomyelitis, uh, as well as uh, a meningoencephalitis. That was the first case uh, uh, in, in a patient of 81 years old uh, that was in Panuto uh, in the Solomon Islands. In his, uh, the first case of acute myelitis was published in La Ile de la Guadalupe in Point a uh, in a 15 years old girl that was admitted uh, on January of 2016. Seizures and epilepsy in patients with congenital Zika syndrome is a, is a major problem. Uh, this is a paper at the a New England Journal of Medicine by the Pernambuco Group. 
where they found a high frequency of a infantile spasm uh, and a, a, an ipsarrhythmic EEG pattern and a severe type of epilepsy. Also uh, uh, in the Caribbean uh, region, and Londaisa uh, published the first case of Zika vasculitis. Uh, this is a patient having a, a, a stroke in the middle artery. Uh, so in our region, uh, in Latin America, one of the problems that we have is the co-circulation of different type of arbovirus. And at the same time, dengue, uh, Zika, chikungunya, this is, this is a major problem uh, that usually you need to identify which is one uh, in the clinical um, evaluation. So I would like to discuss about uh, the second virus, uh, which is a chikungunya. As you know, chikungunya is a, a, belongs a, a, is a single chain linear RNA arbovirus that is also transmitted by Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus and was uh, first detected in the Southern Tanzania in 1952. The name chikungunya is a Swahili for that which bends up. Since the classical clinical symptoms include fever and joint pain, and joint pain can persist for, for months to years after infection, causing patients to adopt a bent stooping posture. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, identification of chikungunya paper in Southern Tanzania by Dr. Lundsden. Uh, and you can see here in Tanganyika uh, was the, the first case identified in uh, Tanzania. Uh, after the bite of infected mosquitoes, uh, the chikungunya virus causes a characteristic febrile syndrome, uh, having a headache, rash, and severe arthralgia. And the patient can develop a polyarticular large joint arthritis during the acute infections. Uh, and symptoms of joint pain can linger for months following infection. By 2014, 1 million suspected cases and two, uh, 20,000 confirmed cases uh, were identified in 15 countries in North, South, and Central America. Uh, and uh, chikungunya has been associated with many neurological clinical manifestations, including meningitis, encephalitis, encephalomyeloradiculitis. Uh, and the diagnosis of chikungunya usually uh, is, uh, is made uh, by PCR, but at west, as well as serological using acute or, or, or convalescent serum. Chikungunya uh, can cause uh, a significant nervous uh, morbidity, especially in young children. And in India, for instance, in 2006, uh, chikungunya uh, was reported associated to uh, meningoencephalitis, seizures, mm -hmm. Guillain Barre syndrome, myelopathy, and myeloneuropathy. Uh, we report uh, this paper on children uh, because there are few observational studies uh, and uh, that was published by Professor Sandra, our study of the clinical feature in neurological complication of 2035 pediatric cases of chikungunya that were hospitalized in Honduras during the 2015 outbreak in Honduras. And the main uh, clinical manifestation of these cases uh, were fever, rash, irritability, arthralgia, uh, myalgia, vomiting, headache, diarrhea. Uh, and the uh, vast majority were infants between 1 to 12 months of age. The main uh, clinical uh, manifestation uh, 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 in our uh, patients having neurological problem uh, where uh, in 57 of our cases were having seizures, lethargy, vomiting, and uh, 59 were uh, 
uh, identified by PCR having seizures, 34 having meningoencephalitis, uh, also other uh, syndromes uh, like hepatitis, myocarditis, sepsis, and chaff. Uh, that was a, a major concern in our country when we were facing this outbreak. So we know at this moment that uh, also this uh, uh, chikungunya virus uh, can be transmitted uh, by mother to child in a vertical transmission that was, was first identified in the Reunion Island. Uh, also in adults, uh, we have uh, working uh, in a recent paper uh, uh, by Jorge Ortiz, uh, Professor England has been involved as well in 95 cases uh, of uh, suspected chikungunya. We found 7% of those having encephalitis uh, and uh, uh, several of our patients were having uh, in the MRI focal abnormalities as you can see here. And one of the patient dies uh, uh, showing a cerebral edema lymphocytic infiltrate with focal necrosis in hippocampus, frontal lobe, and, and medulla oblongata. So uh, encephalitis, chikungunya encephalitis is high frequent. This is uh, at least 20 reports on the literature. Finally, I would like just uh, uh, make uh, uh, some comments about dengue fever that uh, we know is part of a member of the flavivirus genus. Uh, there are four uh, gen genetically and antigenetically distinct serotypes of dengue, as we know. And in countries uh, uh, like in India or in Latin America, uh, the co-circulation of multiple serotypes. Uh, we, uh, in the last uh, uh, year, in this year, we are having not just the pandemic of Corona, virus, the COVID-19, but as well as uh, the dengue fever with a high uh, mortality rate in, in our uh, community. Uh, in at least 20% of our cases uh, are a severe uh, dengue. Uh, as uh, we know, actually, we, we have a, a new classification, uh, the dengue fever and the severe dengue. Uh, neurological dengue is classified as a form of severe dengue. And uh, the dengue uh, can produce the usual uh, symptoms of headache, uh, retroorbital pain, rash, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, myalgia. And uh, in individuals with prior exposure of dengue virus, re-exposure to another serotype plays the individual at increased risk for severe dengue. Uh, this severe dengue, previously known as dengue hemorrhagic fever, as we know, is characterized by increased vascular permeability, thrombocytopenia, hypotension, and hemorrhagic manifestation. Uh, so in order, in a country where we, we have several arboviruses, uh, the plaque reduction neutralization test is, is one of the best ones because of the cross uh, reaction between uh, sick and dengue infections. Uh, as we know, uh, uh, the dengue fever was uh, first documented uh, by William Smart in uh, 1827. Uh, that was the description of, the, of uh, Professor Smart in a children that was having a convulsion and uh, then uh, was having a kind of dementia uh, and uh, then uh, this uh, dementia type uh, uh, problem, uh, which was lasting, uh, and he said that may attend the stage of resolution of the disease in early person also. And then, uh, the neurologic involvement occurs between four to 5% in confirmed dengue ca cases. Uh, the incidence of dengue infection in patients with suspected central nervous system is noted between 4.2 in southern Vietnam to 13.5 in Jamaica, mainly encephalitis, meningitis, myelitis, and guillain barre syndrome. I would like to highlight that we are, at this moment, facing other viruses, as, as we know that is the main concern of 
in the world because of the COVID, but uh, the Mayaro virus uh, is a, a neglected threat at this moment. So my message, uh, uh, the last message that I would like to highlight in this presentation uh, is the high global expansion and redistribution of the Aedes borne viruses transmission risk associated to the climate change. It's crucial uh, for neurologists and, and neuroscientists to understand the neurotropic arthropod borne viruses pathophysiology mechanism Zika, dengue, and chikungunya arbovirus infection have wide spectrum of neurological consequences and represent neuropathological agents with several neurological complications. Zika virus, mainly the Asian uh, one, has a neurotropism that can affect the human fetal brain neuronal, neural stem cells producing congenital Zika syndrome. Zika, dengue, and chikungunya infection can produce a, an autoimmune response uh, producing a glycolipids and associated to Kilian Barre in the case of Zika. But Zika also can directly infect peripheral neurons and cause substantial cell death and pathogenic transcription of this regulation. Mm -hmm. This uh, Zika, dengue, and chikungunya infection can have direct viral inflammatory process in the central nervous systems, producing meningoencephalitis, encephalitis, acute myelitis, and also producing vasculitis by a, a primary human brain microvascular endothelial cell damage. Thank you very much for your attention. So Dr. Medina, thank you very much for that masterful review of arbovirus infections and particularly the neurological complications. Now, I don't know how Dr. Meshram wants to do this. There are a few questions that you yeah, can the, access. Yeah, yeah. you uh, can ask uh, Professor Medina to answer those questions. Hello. John. Yes. Yes. Uh, you can take on those questions and uh, Professor Marco will uh, uh, answer those questions. Okay. Yeah. So okay. one of the questions for Dr. Medina, I don't know if he can see them. If not, I can read them for him. Please. One of the questions is, can cerebral palsy without any known calls be due to maternal Zika infection? Yes, uh, we have identified uh, this uh, uh, manifestation. The case that I, I was showing you was initially identified as cerebral uh, uh, palsy. Uh, and, and so this is a, a, a cause of cerebral palsy among our children. And, uh, one of the uh, uh, key elements uh, that can help us is the antecedent of uh, Zika, the mother, or a macular papular rash during. But also, you can you must remember that Zika, the vast majority of uh, of uh, person having Zika can be asymptomatic. So uh, retrospectively, you can uh, you need to uh, do uh, imaging studies. And if you found, uh, if you find, a, sorry, if you find um, a microcephaly with calcification plus pachygeria and or lysencephalic features, uh, you can mainly make the diagnosis of congenital Zika syndrome associated to cerebral palsy. Yes, thank you. Another question is directed towards Zika virus. And the question is, can Zika virus directly invade the brain, causing encephalitis? Uh, yes, uh, that has been uh, reported uh, cases with meningoencephalitis. Uh, uh, we have evaluated patients having a, a, a direct uh, 
involvement uh, of the brain, uh, and not just uh, the brain, but also the meningeal uh, region. And, uh, and so, yes, it's, it's a frequent and manifestation among uh, adults. Yes, and there's another rather important question. Many of the neurological manifestations are similar between the arboviruses, particularly in adult patients, between Zika, chikungunya, dengue virus. So how do you differentiate them? And how, if, how can you do that? Okay, yes, uh, in, for instance, in Honduras, we, we have the co-circulation of, uh, of uh, dengue, Zika, and chikungunya is quite difficult. But for instance, if you have a patient having con a non purulent conjunctivitis plus headache, uh, uh, fever, rash, et cetera, and you can think on Zika. If you have a severe arthritis and arthralgia associated uh, to the same symptoms without conjunctivitis, you can think uh, on chikungunya. Uh, and dengue, dengue usually uh, is not associated uh, with uh, uh, conjunctivitis uh, and is associated with a severe headache. Uh, but sometimes clinically it's quite difficult. So uh, doing the PCR uh, or the serological testing is quite important uh, in order to differentiate. But for instance, in dengue fever, the, uh, the thrombocytopenia uh, is a, a quite important uh, lab finding that uh, also uh, that can help you on the clinical differentiation. Thank you. I think another important question is perhaps what do you think about the changing environment, the change in climate, cross cutting through jungles, manipulating factors such as this in the spread of arbovirus diseases? Yes, uh, this is a, a major, major problem uh, in, in our uh, countries in, in Latin America. Uh, you know, the Amazon area or in the Amazon area in Brazil or, or also in Colombia that shares uh, the Amazonian or in Central America, a, a major destruction of uh, the Amazonic uh, uh, or the selvatic areas uh, uh, is, is a major concern because the mosquitoes is, is, uh, is like our pet in, in, our, in our communities. And, and the lacking of water, and, and the people try to preserve water, uh, and then the, uh, you know you have the mosquitoes inside of your home because of people are preserving water, and so this is a, a major problem in, in, in Latin America because uh, uh, of this problem. But then you can see the spreading of these uh, mosquitoes around the world because of the climate change. Uh, so this, this is a major concern for this uh, dangerous animal that usually you said, uh, John. And then moving on to dengue, there's a question about limitations of vaccines in the prevention of dengue. And perhaps you could inform us about the current vaccine that we have for the disease. Yes, uh, you know, the vaccines, uh, the vaccine, the uh, one of the vaccines that were developed uh, and was tested in Latin America was the tetravalent uh, Sanofi vaccine and was evaluated in several countries in, in, Hondur uh, in Honduras was also tested in children. Uh, and uh, according uh, with the data published by this team, including our, our scientists, Honduras scientists, Dr. Rivera, uh, shows that uh, the vaccine was very helpful uh, on uh, especially re uh, reducing the severe type uh, of, den of dengue. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, several countries around the world were starting using that vaccine. But in Philippines, we got 
uh, a, a severe reaction after this phase three evaluation uh, because uh, the, uh, this vaccine, the tetravalent vaccine was producing a hyperinflammatory, hyperimmune reaction. Uh, and then uh, uh, Sanofi stopped that uh, vaccine. Uh, this is one of the concerns about the vaccines. The, after phase three, what happened with the vaccine? Especially that we are thinking also on the COVID-19, you know, this mechanism of high, that can produce uh, a, a hyper immune response like uh, in the tetravalent vaccine on dengue uh, uh, fever. So this is, uh, this is the data that, uh, that we have, that we have. Yeah, your talk is very enlightening. There are many, many questions. And I think that another question that someone would like an answer about, and I think all of us would like your opinion about this, is the importance of cerebrospinal fluid analysis in the diagnosis of neuroinvasive arboviruses. For instance, the use of RT-PCR and immunoglobulin diagnoses. Yes, uh, I think the spinal tap is, is quite important uh, when when you have when you are having a patients with uh, central nervous system uh, and uh, usually and also it's quite important as well on the uh, Guillain Barre clinical uh, manifestation uh, so uh, uh, you know evaluating with the uh, real time uh, uh, PCR is uh, very important trying to differentiate the different uh, viruses. Uh, we have found uh, several cases in uh, in our patients having uh, a, a, for instance, a, a cephalitis that you need to identify if the if, if the symptom if the encephalitis is due to uh, a arbovirus or a airfer virus. So I, I believe that uh, you know the, uh, evaluating this uh, uh, the uh, CSF is crucial for making the differentiation among other uh, uh, encephalitis that can be treated like uh, the herpes encephalitis. Uh, so, uh, a, a, so I believe that that is a, a, a crucial aspect to the evaluation uh, of, of the, also the uh, uh, immunoglobulins and so on, but uh, the main subject is identifying the a virus using the PCR technique. Another question relates to differentiating between congenital Zika syndrome and the Accardi syndrome. And I know you're an expert on both of these, so perhaps you could differentiate them for us. Oh, yes. Uh, Professor Icardi identified a, a infantile spasm that was asymmetrical. Uh, this is a severe type of, uh, of epilepsy uh, in, in the school of uh, Marseille in France uh, with Professor Dravé and Professor uh, Roger. Uh, you know, one of the key aspects is having a asymmetrical ipsarrhythmic EEG uh, abnormalities plus a a a, a, a genesia of corpus callosum, uh, and that is what, and also a, a, a abnormalities in the ophthalmic uh, evaluation. Uh, and this this syndrome, uh, the key aspect is the uh, corpus callosum agenesia, uh, and but without. A, a, a severe uh, pachygeria oligencephalic feature or, uh, that is quite common on, on the, uh, is the, one of the main manifestation of the uh, a congenital Zika syndrome. So uh, also the uh, type of uh, clinical manifestation like arthrogryposis, the microcephaly that is not so common, uh, is not, so important, but uh, in in ICARD, 
So I think the main feature is the, uh, in my opinion, is the asymmetrical uh, uh, infantile spasm, the EEG plus the uh, MRI features. There are so many questions. Maybe we have time for one or two more. And I think a question that most people have is, are there any specific treatments with antiviral treatments that are effective for any of these arboviruses? Okay, uh, the, for the neurologic uh, manifestation, that is uh, one of the, the problems that uh, we are facing, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, we think that we need desperately uh, a clinical trials, especially on, on dengue fever. Uh, at, at this moment, we are working on the solidarity project where Rendesivir or beta interferon has been evaluated. And, and I believe that uh, clinical trials using these uh, antivirus can be a uh, part of the evaluation, but uh, we absolutely, we are lacking uh, a specific treatment. Uh, mainly we are using uh, for the Guillain-Barre syndrome, as we know the immunoglobulin, uh, plasma pheresis, which is the, the standard of care, uh, but, uh, but for encephalitis, meningo, encephalitis, and others, uh, we don't have a, a specific uh, antiviral for this, uh, this problem at this moment. And I believe one last question, which is going to be difficult for any of us to answer yet, is how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected these other viral transmissions? And I don't know that any of us have the answers to that yet. We'll have to see. Can I answer you? Oh, yes, if you have an answer. You know, we are facing the problem. We are facing in Honduras at the same time, time COVID plus dengue fever. Uh, this is a recent report of a patient having at the same time COVID and dengue in a report in, in Yucatan and here in Honduras. It's, it's quite difficult to make the differentiation when you have the two comorbidities. But the, what is the main concern is at the public health level. Everybody is in quarantine uh, or many uh, in facing a economical problems and not taking care of the control of mosquitoes uh, by the government, you know? And that has been producing a, a, a problem at the public health, le health uh, level, a, the control of mosquitoes. So producing at the same time, a increase, uh, 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 in increasing uh, rate of uh, dengue fever. So this is, a, this is the main problem, in my opinion. Well, thank you very much. I think we're probably at the end of time for this. And I'd like to thank you again for that brilliant presentation. And as always, you answer the questions beautifully. So with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Meshram and Dr. Kennard, who can introduce the rest of the program. So thank you very much. Thank you and, uh, very much, John. Thank you, Professor Marco. It was a wonderful talk and uh, everyone enjoyed. And uh, now we move on to the this presentation. OK. Professor Chris Kennard will take over. Professor. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Great. Well, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker, who uh, an old friend of mine, uh, Vivek Lal, who is the head and professor of uh, neurology at the uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, uh, which I've had the pleasure to visit a couple of times, uh, and he has a special interest in neuroophthalmology. So his uh, the case that he's going to present is a case of acute unexplained visual loss. So over to you, Vivek. Can somebody start the video? Video, please. Thank you.
thank you, Professor. Okay, we'll be back. Are you ready to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for your kind introduction. And as always, it's always a pleasure to be in front of you <laughs> and discuss a few things of mutual interest. So I have this unusual case and uh, which we, I mean, something very typical that we do. Yeah, Vivek, your uh, voice is less. Speak loudly. Is that okay now? Yeah. Yeah. So I have uh, two unusual cases to discuss, both of uh, 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 both of a very, very unusual cause, infective cause, which actually forks our, you know, clinical judgment. So the first one is a 18. Excuse me, we are having some technical difficulty regarding sharing of the screen. Can somebody check it? We are having some difficulty scared, you know, sharing of the screen. Yeah, Mansi, can you help uh, Dr. Vivek to share the screen? Yes, sir, I'll do that. Uh, so you will have to, uh, the, the green button uh, doesn't seem to be working, the share screen one. It's showing error that uh, screen sharing has failed to start. Please try again later. Uh, actually, your voice is not very much audible. If you... It's saying that the screen sharing has failed to start. Please try again later. Okay, so what you could do is actually you could log out and log into the meeting again. Just click on the link which was given to you. Then you will be taken into the meeting again. And uh, we could uh, start sharing. Okay, we will do that. Yes, sir. It's still not coming, please. Dr. Meshram, do you want to do the second case first? We're trying to sort it out. Hmm? Dr. Meshram? Yeah, I think uh, you can. We can probably have the second case till. Yeah, I think I'll do so Rajiv. Yeah. Rajiv. Okay, so we. All right. Well, then there's the second case is uh, Doctor uh, Rajiv Sherman, <coughs> who <coughs> is former uh, professor of medicine, a case of compromised host. Uh, hang on, we've got Vivek back. So you can go on to the next case and then I'll come back with you. Yeah, I think till that time then Vivek can get. Yeah. Sudhir? So Dr. Rajiv is not in. Okay, uh, what about Dr. Anita? Yeah, yeah. I think we can go to Anita. Okay, so we'll go to the third case. 
uh, from Professor Anita Mahadevan, who is Professor of Neuropathology at IMHANS Bangalore. Uh, Bangalore. So, are you there, Anita? Yeah, I'm here. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. So, do you want to uh, proceed? I could do that. Yes. All right. Yeah. So, Thank you, Dr. Kenner. Am I audible? Yes, yes. So um, I was I the uh, pathology is actually usually the last stop, but it looks like uh, I'm going to be the first to start off a case. I'm sorry for the quirky title. I've called it "Dead Men Do Tell Tales." Also, this case is a lady. The reason I put that in is because I think back home at Nimhans, we've learned several lessons over the years. And I would like to share one of those with you. Before that, of course, all of these lessons are thanks to a very active clinical team. That's Professor Tally. We have Dr. Sinha and Dr. Madhu who provided this case to us. Uh, who I think all of you are very familiar with and know that they would always try and get to the bottom of a diagnosis. So this is one such case I'm going to share with you. And of course, none of this would have been possible without our mortuary and the brain bank staff and two labs that we use to get at the final diagnosis. So I'll try and finish within the 20 minutes stipulated in case I go beyond it. Just let me know. So this was a 37 year old lady who hailed from Mandya. She was at Nimhans for two days in the year, this was way back in 2013. She presented with a fever of one week duration, vomiting of one day, seven to eight episodes, and convulsions one day prior to admission, which was uh, generalized tonic clonic and semiology, 15 to 20 such episodes, which, uh, each of which lasted for about 20 seconds. She lapsed into altered sensorium and she was brought to our hospital. Past history was significant in that she was diagnosed with pulmonary tuberculosis two years ago, for which she had received anti-tuberculous therapy for six months. Family history, what was significant was that the mother had presumed to have CNS tuberculosis, and she died of a heart attack at the young age of 50 years. The patient's husband had died also due to pulmonary tuberculosis, and her son had allegedly committed suicide, either due to depression or psychosis. We don't have clear data on that. On admission to our hospital, the patient was in altered sensorium. She was decerebrating to painful stimuli. Systemic examination non-contributory. Her hemogram, uh, this is just the basic. Uh, her HV was 12.5, total count was okay. Except for her thrombocytopenia, which was 94,000, everything else was fine. Her biochemistry, both the liver function, renal function, normal. And only the, the random blood sugar was 205, but she was on an IV line. The CSF that was done showed sheets of red blood cells and hence a count was not possible. Her total protein in the CSF was 465, a glucose of 96 and chloride of 115. Other relevant investigations, HIV was negative. A VDRL which was done was non-reactive. RA-ANA by latex was negative. And this was the MRI. I understand that uh, the audience cannot interact. So I'll just read it out. Uh, contrast was not done. These are the T2 sequences that you're looking at multiple lesions that you can see in the bilateral, frontal, insular, you can see it also in the right parieto occipital, also involving the cerebellar vermis. And uh, her course in the hospital, she was started on anti-tuberculous therapy, received antibiotics, methylprednisolone, anti-epileptic drugs, and anti-edema measures. There was no recurrence of seizures while in hospital. However, sensorium did not improve. She developed pupillary asymmetry on the 31st, that is one day after admission, she went into a respiratory arrest, hypotension, fixed dilated pupils, and loss of brainstem reflexes. She was intubated, started on mechanical ventilation with inotropic support. She sustained a cardiac asystole from which she could not be revived. So a total hospital duration stay was two days, and a partial autopsy was requested because we did not know the final diagnosis. So just to recap, Acute onset fever, encephalitis, thrombocytopenia, an MRI which showed hemorrhagic lesions in the left frontal, bilateral insular, right parieto occipital, and cerebellar. There was a past history of pulmonary tuberculosis and a family history of 
tuberculosis. So the clinical possibilities considered by the clinicians was one, infective because of the past history of tuberculosis, or whether it was a non-infective inflammatory process. So this was what we saw at autopsy. I'll go quickly through the findings. You're looking at the surface view of the brain. That's the superior sagittal sinus, which we've opened up. There is no thrombus there. However, when you're looking at the superolateral aspect of the brain, you can see that there is a hemorrhagic discoloration out here. This hole is where we have taken a section from, but you can see that the veins out here look very turgid and there is a hemorrhagic discoloration. Now, this is a close up view and you can see the veins now on both sides. On the left side, it is very clearly enlarged and turgid. This is the bottom view of the brain. You can see the structures very well, which to us indicates that there is no basal exudate to consider tuberculosis. This is the circle of villus that we have dissected out and it looks essentially normal. So we sliced, we've literally bread loafed the brain into multiple slices. And even at this magnification, you can see multiple hemorrhagic lesions. We've tried to match it with the MR imaging and you can see corresponding to these hemorrhagic lesions, you can see on some areas it is ischemic necrosis. On the other, what is very, very striking is this kind of a hemorrhagic lesion, which is involving the cortical ribbon. There's bilateral insular involvement, and you can see it extending posteriorly. There is thalamic involvement on this side, insular on this side. As you go down, you can see the cerebellar vermis, which had shown hemorrhagic lesions, was seen even on gross examination of the brain. So this is just a close-up view of the cortical ribbon, which was hemorrhagic. And this is the sulcus. At the bottom of the sulcus, you can see, I've tried to arrow it down for you. You can see some of the vessels which appear thrombosed or it's kind of filled with a cloth. So this is a section of the same area. And all of this red tells you that there is blood within these circular structures, which are the blood vessels. This is a close-up view. That's an artery in the subarachnoid space looking at. And as you go snaking down the bottom of a sulcus, you can see multiple tiny vessels which are plugged with fibrin. And you can see a larger vessel at the bottom of the sulcus, which is also plugged. And almost like a back pressure, every little venule which would have drained into these cortical veins are all engorged. And you can see as a close up, this is just a fancy stain, which is called a mason trichrome stain to show you the amount of hemorrhage that you're looking at. All the orange that you're seeing are, are extensive areas of hemorrhage. That's a vein in the cortex, in the subarachnoid space. You can see it filled with RBCs. And in the cortical ribbon below, every little venule you're looking at here are ruptured. And you can see RBCs, which are extravasating into the parenchyma. So this is the routine hematoxyl neosin stain where you can see RBCs orange. And the same thing better brought out on a mason trichrome stain. Another view here, you can see very nicely that there is a fibrin thrombus, which is plugging a thin walled vein. Here there are perivenular hemorrhages, but what was striking, wherever these hemorrhagic lesions were there, we did not see any inflammation. So that's an artery which is normal, a cortical vein which is thrombosed. And this is a close up view of uh, parenchymal venules which were thrombosed. This is a Luxol fast blue stain, which is a stain for myelin. And just to show you that this is the white matter here. And you can see the venules which are thrombosed going into the white matter. But the blue of the myelin is still beautifully preserved. The areas where the blue is gone is essentially where there were hemorrhages. So there are necrotic thrombosed venules, but no demyelination that we could recognize. So just to summarize, we are looking at meningeal, parenchymal venules plugged with thrombi. There was back pressure with rupture of veins and multiple hemorrhages in the cortical gray ribbon. So essentially what we were looking at was a venous pathology with minimal inflammation or vasculitis. So what could it be? What could be the cause of such widespread vascular thrombosis of the cortical veins causing multiple hemorrhages? First off, is it infective? In which case we would think TB because of the past history. But uh, more commonly, we would see it with fungal, protozoal, or viral. So we went in that particular order. What was against TB is that there were no basal exudates. We could demonstrate no acid fast bacilli. We did not see any inflammation. If you realize, I pointed that out. There was no granulomatous vasculitis. And we know that hemorrhages are uncommon. And a predominant venous pathology is extraordinarily rare. 
So when we went back and looked at the histology, we were looking at edema, we were looking at areas of infarction, and there were these structures which we could see dotting the parenchyma. They were large ones. Some of them had engulfed red blood cells. And when we look at these, the first thing that comes to mind is, are they trophozoites of amoeba? Now, to know if they're really trophozoites, we have to do a per iodic acid skip stain, and these should stand out a magenta pink, and these were negative. So what were those structures if they were not amoeba? Now, this is an immunohistochemical stain for CD68, which is a mac marker for macrophages. So these large cells that we thought were amoeba were, in fact, macrophages. So uh, an amoebic meningoencephalitis was excluded. Second on the list was fungal because of the extensive hemorrhages. Ma many of you must have thought about fungal etiology. To demonstrate fungi, we do something called a methanamine silver stain. And we did not see any hyphal forms which were going through and through the thrombosed vessels. So that was out. Now, what about the other protozoal, if not amoeba? We would think of toxoplasma, which we all know are associated with hemorrhagic lesions. Now, we have an immunohistochemistry for toxoplasmosis, and these are the tachyzoids that will stand out brown. Now, this is a control. This is the patient's brain tissue, which was negative. So, essentially, most of the infective etiologies that we consider TB, fungal, protozoal, amoebic, toxoplasma, we excluded, which left us with viral, which are the viruses which would cause an acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalitis. We would first, of course, want to exclude an acute necrotizing hemorrhagic leukoencephalitis, which is a HERS disease. We know it's in hyperacute form. It can follow a virus or a mycoplasma lesion. But remember that most of these lesions in HERS would be in the white matter, and they would be hemorrhagic. Here, we were looking at gray matter hemorrhagic lesions with a lot of fibrinoid necrosis and neutrophils with perivenous demyelination, which was characteristically absent in our case. So absence of lesions in the white matter, absence of perivendular demyelination rules out a first disease. So coming back to the viral, we already had Professor Medina telling us about viruses. So proof of pudding is in the eating. So which of the viruses would we think of here? Now, the hemorrhagic viral encephalitis, most often we know is hirchisly. There are other viruses like zoster, entero, EBV, all of which can also produce hemorrhagic lesions. And this was the imaging that we saw in our case. Now, our radiologist friends always tell me that we don't need a brain to be examined to tell us which virus it is. We have radiology signatures which can very easily tell us which virus. So it essentially doesn't fit into any of these. And we first looked at whether it's herpes. Now, any viral infection, when we look at the brain, we would expect inflammation. We expect an encephalitis. We want to see microglide nodules and viral inclusions, none of which we could demonstrate in this case. However, we still did immunohistochemistry. This is the control for herpes and the brain itself. When we examined of this patient, there was no HSV viral antigen. So there are five families of the RNA viruses that can produce viral hemorrhagic fever. We have the Flavi, Arena, Gunia, and the Philo. But in India, most often we zero down on dengue and the KFD. Now, the acute hemorrhagic viral encephalitis, if it is dengue, we know that we expect to see thalamic cerebellar hemorrhages. If it is any of the flavy viruses, they tend to affect the midline structures like thalamus and basal ganglia more frequently. And all of those areas were, in fact, spared in our case. But then you would still want proof, right? So we went to Exciton. Exciton is one of our uh, labs in Bangalore. They have come up with this magic uh, wand is what we like to call it. It's a panel. It's a multiplex PCR, which has a whole host of viruses, all of which we can look at in just one stroke, one drop of CSF. So they have a panel which can pick up HSV, VZV, CMV, HHV6, CBV, Dengue, Leptospira, and Scrub Typhus. So we sent the CSF across to them, and all of them were negative. And we already know that the HIV was negative. So what next? Since we had kind of reasonably excluded the infective etiologies, it brings us to the non-infective causes. First up on the list would be a CNS vasculitis. Back to that same vessel, they were mostly veins and venules. They were thrombosed. The arteries were spared. And we, within those thrombosed vessels, we hardly saw any inflammation despite the thrombus. Some of the vessels did show polymorphs, though, which was with the extravasation of the RBC. 
So which kind of rules out a CNS vasculitis since we could not demonstrate any vasculitis on histology. So last on the list would be, can it be a coagulopathy which is causing this widespread thrombosis? Now you would argue that a BT, CT, PT, all of these we cannot really do in a post-mortem sample. However, we could do the others. We had done a VDRL already anti-mortem which was negative. A homocysteine was negative. A protein C and protein S could not be done because it was a post-mortem sample. However, the antiphospholipid antibodies were all negative. What remained was an anti-cardiolipin IgM, which was strongly positive. Which brings you to the question, is this an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? If so, how do we confirm? But the question that niggles the back of your mind, can it be really so rapidly fatal? All within the span of one week, it's over. We know that there are several classes of antiphospholipid antibodies. We know that they bind to endothelium and they produce a thrombotic storm. There are two kinds. It can be a primary APLA, it could be secondary when associated with other autoimmune diseases, most often the SLE or other rheumatological. Several organs can be involved in APLA and it can involve both the veins and the arteries and brain can be involved both sides of the spectrum. There are several clinical manifestations and uh, most often we have CVT and FTC. I just highlighted what we see in our case. And pathology wise, you would see that there would be vascular thrombi, which is what you see, which is very similar to SLE. I know all of you, if you could speak, would caution me that general population can show, stroke patients can show, epilepsy can show, it can be an acute fate reactant. How then do we diagnose? These are diagnostic criteria for APLA. I'll just zip through this because I'm at the end of the time limit. In this particular case, we had histological proof that there was thrombosis without any significant inflammation. We had IgM as a lab criteria. However, we need to confirm by retesting after 20 weeks, which we possibly do not because this patient died. Last question, can it be fatal? called a catastrophic APLA syndrome. A definite gap requires the presence of four simultaneous evidence in at least one organ, which we saw in our case. We had lab evidence of cardiolipin antibodies. All of these four are not there. We could call it probable. Then three or four are there. In case, we have two of the four criteria. So can it be a possible caps? Because we couldn't determine all the other reasons. Pathology in caps, which you have seen here, it's a non-inflammatory thrombotic microangiopathy causing tissue necrosis, and CNS can be increased to 56%. Usually precipitating factors for this. In our case, there has been an infection. So this is possibly what we think is that it's a catastrophic APLA. The triggering factor is a what we haven't answered is whether it's primary or secondary. Now, primary or secondary caps is usually SLE, Jogren's, or RA associated. So we send the blood across to for ANA by immunofluorescence, and bingo, this is what we saw. What you're looking at is a speckled positivity by immunofluorescence. So the ANA is positive, but remember, speckled can be drug-induced, and this particular patient was on INH, carbamazepine, phenytoin, all of which can produce a speckled ANA positivity. How then do we confirm? So we did an ANA blot and we found that the anti-SM, which is the most specific antibody for SLE, although found only in 30 to 40%, is highly sensitive and specific. So, but then is there tissue confirmation that this is vasculitis? We have taken the sural nerve at autopsy, which did not show inflammation. However, the quadriceps showed distinct presence of inflammation and the skin biopsy also showed evidence of small vessel vasculitis. So the last question, was the seizures also due to SLE? Interestingly, when we went back and looked at the MR, there was one focus calcified here that our clinician friends were going on telling us. They picked that up at autopsy and you know what that was? That is a good old healed calcified cysticircle cyst. So it's up for grabs whether SLE cause seizures or the cysticircle cyst, I don't have an answer. So to wrap up, this is a catastrophic APLA syndrome. It was a secondary caps associated with SLE. The trigger was an infection which we could not identify. And the risk factor is speculative in our case, but because we think it's familial because the mother had a heart attack at a young age. 
the son also committed suicide probably due to depression and psychosis so we are speculating that maybe there was a familial thrombophilic state so bottom line we think it's a catastrophic apla syndrome which was associated with sld so just to illustrate that we think dead men do tell tales and so do women so thank you very much for your attention if there are questions i'm happy to take thank you very much indeed that's a very interesting case um so we've got uh some questions here um Did you see uh, uh, uterine artery pulmonary vessels for HPE? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. We had a consent from the family only to examine the brain. And uh, we could right. not right. lung, but we were speculating that maybe that pulmonary tuberculosis that was thought of might very well have been part of the SLE. But we do not right. have okay. proof. But it's a good question. So, so do we have any other questions? Um, I don't think we do at the moment. Uh, in view of the fact that we've had some difficulty with getting the other speakers on, we, I think we better move on to the next uh, the next speaker. So thank you very much Vivek, indeed. Vivek Fascinating is ready case. Now. Yes. Sorry? Vivek Lal is ready. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Vivek, are you on? Are you? Yes. Have you solved the problem? Here yeah. we are. Yeah. Right. Okay. So Professor Lal is going to present a case of uh, a rare cause of visual loss. Thank you so much, Professor Lal. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the technical glitch. So Don't worry. Two, two, unusual all. Cases, two unusual cases of visual loss due to a very very unusual cause. So the first patient is an 18 year old. Hale and hearty male who presented with headaches for one month and catastrophic loss of vision of two weeks duration. He was absolutely fine before a month when he had these headaches and bilateral visual loss. The headaches were holocranial. There was no vomiting. There was no diplopia, phonophotophobia. And he noticed visual loss two weeks after the onset of headaches when he noticed that one eye was involved, that the right eye was involved before the left eye was involved. And within a span of four to five days, he had complete visual loss in both the eyes. He was a cannabis abuser and he used to take country made liquor. So this had increased over the last one week. So when you have this kind of a history of headaches and bilateral visual loss in a cannabis abuser, the first thing that you kind of tend to think of is, are you looking at a reversible vasoconstriction syndrome? Because we all know cannabis is known to cause a reversible vasoconstriction syndrome. The visual loss was catastrophic. So when we examined him, he was fully conscious, he was fully oriented. Higher mental functions are normal, except that he was PL negative in both the eyes and the pupils were non-reactive. The fundus examination disclosed that he had normal discs. So there was no atrophy visible in spite of the fact that he was PL negative in both the eyes. But what was conspicuous was the presence of a macular scar, atrophic scarring in both the eyes, left more than the right. And in addition to the macular scar that was visible here, he had a featureless retina and he had inflammatory exudates. So basically this patient's loss of vision, which was catastrophic, was probably related to a maculopathy. Notice very carefully that the disc isn't showing anything substantial. So we went ahead and did a, in this case, this is things. We have a good rapport with our, uh, you know, ophthalmology colleagues. And without them, we wouldn't be standing here, honestly. Professor Kennard, if you want to be a neuro-ophthalmologist, you have to make sure that you have the ophthalmologist on your side. So when this, uh, you know, OCT was done. This is a normal retina on the right side where all the layers are very well visible. You are having the choroid, you are having all the layers speak and span. This patient had got liquefactive necrosis of the retina. They, you know, the, the, the hyporeflective area 
between the two layers between the outer and the inner layer shows that this is a necros retina and in addition this patient had some inflammatory deposits in the retina so when when the ophthalmology colleague of ours a mentor in fact he is not a colleague he is he is an iconic mentor saw this he suggested a possibility which i'll discuss later we as always went ahead and did an mri now when we did the mri what we noticed was that this patient is having occipital hyperintensities on t2 weighted imaging and not only is this patient having occipital hyperintensities on t2 weighted imaging the lateral geniculate bodies on both the sides are also hyperintense and which is more obviously seen on a t2 flare coronal image so what we were having was a pathology that was involving the retina all this is happening within a span of 2 weeks from being normal vision he becomes no pl no pr in 2 weeks so he was having something that was involving the necro which was involving the retina causing necrosis of the macula was sparing the optic disc and was going on to involve the lateral geniculate body and the occipital cortex notice that the radiations are also involved you can see some hyper intensity in the radiations also so when we had this kind of a scenario we did the diffusion weighted imaging we were looking for an infection here and we noticed that there is some diffusion restriction here in the occipital cortex which was showing a hyper intensity on t2 weighted imaging and the adc was showing definitely a reversal you are seeing this adc image compare this with the opposite side you are having hypo densities here so the patient was having diffusion restriction the patient was having involvement of the lateral geniculate body the optic radiations and the occipital cortex on mri besides the retina on oct and fundus examination so this is another cross image showing us diffusion restriction of both the occipital cortex and the lateral geniculate body when we did the contrast enhancing image t1 contrast we did not get anything significant in comparison to what we were seeing on diffusion weighted imaging except that we noticed some spotty uptake of contrast in the involved occipital lobe so there was something going on which was not contrast enhancing which wasn't brilliantly contrast enhancing if at all it was not contrast enhancing but was characterized by a carnage that was extending right from the retina to the lateral geniculate body to the occipital lobe we investigated this patient as we all do the crp was elevated the rest of the investigations were plumb normal his viral serology was normal the csf also did not disclose anything ominous at all we were strongly suspecting that this patient being a cannabis abuser may be suffering from cryptococcal uh, involvement of the brain we all know cryptococcus is notoriously known to have a predilection for vision but here the cryptola and the india ink was negative we did the tb pcr and hsv pcr which was again negative and the vdrl was also negative so we actually didn't know what we were looking at but our ophthalmology colleague as i told you had given us a clue and uh, we went back to the oct again besides the fundus examination which was showing atrophic macular stars the oct was showing a clear cut destruction and decimation of the retina notice that none of these layers was visible on this oct and this was very early on in the illness within 2 weeks this oct was done and it was showing complete destruction of the retina and i remember professor our professor of ophthalmology professor amud gupta saying vivek this is liquefactive necrosis of the retina so when you have this kind of a liquefactive necrosis against this background you we realized that the headaches were probably unrelated and we went ahead and did a virological study which came out to be strongly positive this patient was strongly positive for measles antibody 
and this was a clincher in the diagnosis of our patient. The diagnosis in this patient was made on the basis of an atrophic macular star, chorioretinitis, and an OCT showing complete destruction of the retina. Please note that this patient at this given time only had savage visual loss, nothing else. We did the EEG, and when we did the EEG, after we got the, you know, uh, we got the reports, the, the serology reports, which were obtained from Nimhans Bangalore, which is where Anita Mahadevan works. Good evening, Anita. So this was showing us giant reader marker complexes repetitively occurring. This is very classically seen in SSPE, subacute closing panencephalitis, which is a chronic manifestation, a chronic ramification of long-standing measles. There is a, you know, there is a tweaking of the M antigen, which prevents the virus, which, which actually makes the virus evade the system. And you get this within 10 years after having measles. Retrospectively, we got a history of measles in this patient. And we also found out that this patient was not vaccinated for measles. So that's how we came to a diagnosis of SSP in this patient. Over the last 30 years, we would have seen, I mean, on an average, we get to see two patients of visual loss because of SSP. In 50%, the patient would be having myoclonus before he gets visual loss. And the other 50%, visual loss is the initial manifestation of SSP. Autopsy studies prove that at the time of demise, 90% of patients of SSP have got pathological evidence of visual loss. Now, the clue for SSP in this patient was the damage, the, 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 the horrifying damage to the retina. When you have this kind of a liquefactive necrosis, when you have this kind of a carnage involving the fundus, where the optic nerve is spared and the macula is involved, you must always entertain SSP in this part of the world and other underdeveloped parts of the world. So that was case number one. Here's another female. Now. That one was a male patient. This one was still another lady who presented in exactly the same way. Here, this lady didn't have you know, headaches. She just came with catastrophic sequential loss of vision, right eye followed by the left eye, within a span of three weeks. So before three weeks, she was absolutely hale and hearty. She didn't have any headache. She did not have any constitutional sim symptoms. She was treated elsewhere with methylprednisolone without any improvement. So when you think of an optic neuritis like an NMO or a MOG syndrome, and you give steroids and there is no improvement, then you are probably looking at a masquerade. It is not an optic neuritis. It is not an NMO or a MOG syndrome probably something which is masquerading as an NMO MOX syndrome. So when this patient came to us, she had finger counting both eyes. The left eye had on one meter and the right eye, there was no, P, no projection of light. She had a RAPD in the right eye. The extraocular movements, the systemic examination was within normal limits. Now have a look at the fundus again in this patient. Here, what you get to see is there is a pale optic disc in contrast to the previous patient. You're noticing some temporal paler if you look at it carefully. And the dull, there was a dull foveal reflex. There were atrophic sheath vessels. You're seeing these vessels, these ghost vessels. They're going through. These are atrophic sheath vessels. And these vessels were involving the macula. Besides, of course, having an atrophic scar in the macula and some edema. This is a classical finding again seen in this kind of a disease, which often ravages the, you know, ophthalmological, uh, 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 ravages the vision. The retina was featureless. Notice there is complete or near complete loss of vessels. The right eye was, I mean, was showing us a more dramatic picture, lot of edema, lot of hemorrhages, and a lot of disc edema. So unlike the previous patient, where the patient had already got a scarring within two weeks of the onset of illness, this one was having an active disease. 
there were retinal and subretinal hemorrhages and this was confirmed by fluorescein angiogram where you had filling defects overlying the hemorrhages this is important for us to remember and this is the scarring seen here these are the filling defects which you are getting to see the overlying blood vessels are kind of being blurred because of the filling defects due to again we went ahead and did the oct i think oct is something that we cannot do without in any patient of acute visual loss involving the anterior visual pathways what did we get the right eye there was foveal atrophy notice that the retina has been completely obliterated whereas in the left eye you were getting plenty of inflammatory exudates in the right there was necrosis and there was subretinal exudation we did a detailed neurological examination believe me we got nothing nothing means nothing the rest of the systemic examination was normal we did an mri in this patient as always we all do it the optic nerves were well seen what we noticed look at this very carefully was some inconspicuous specks again posteriorly in the parieto occipital region of the brain parent chyma was plum normal you were getting these specks and believe me this mri was done before we did the fundus examination so this patient came to us with an mri when we saw the fundus and when we saw the oct we went back and looked at the mri and we picked up these dots which we had initially missed it's a better view notice very carefully that they are better visible now so this patient also had some specks less conspicuous than the previous patient in addition to retinal involvement now whenever you have involvement of the retina and optic nerve it's important to rule out inflammatory infectious and para infectious causes we all knew that this is not a demyelinating illness no demyelination to our knowledge falls the retina as savagely as was there in both our patients retina is classically spared in nmo mog and ms syndrome it's basically an optic neuropathy an optic inflammatory disease so we knew we were looking at either an infectious or a para infectious cause we did the csf examination to try and prove the point again no clues normal glucose normal ada india ink negative cryptococcal antigen negative csf vdrl not seen and hsv dna by nested pcr negative so we were drawing a blank again in this patient but as i told you this patient also had similar changes in the oct as the first patient that is liquefactive necrosis of the retina so to prove that indeed we were looking at ssp again we did the eeg and in an asymptomatic patient without any myoclonus we got these slow wave complexes these are giant slow wave complexes occurring repetitively and they are called reader marker complexes they are the hallmark of subacute sclerosing panencephalitis there you can there is theta slowing notice these slow wave complexes they are very typically seen in sspe we did what was expected then everything suggested towards measles as a cause of this savage visual loss long standing ssp we all know that there is a latent period between measles in childhood and ssp in adulthood often they occur at the beginning of the second decade or the end of the second decade and here the antibodies were very very strongly positive this patient did not have any myoclonic jerks when this patient presented to us six months later she came now see video there you are so you seeing the subcortical myoclonus and this is stimulus sensitive there you are 
again, it is stimulus sensitive. So this is the hallmark of SSPE, a subcortical myoclonus, which generally involves the entire body, right? And which is slow in onset and slow in relaxation. The, the, the purpose of showing both these cases was to highlight just how important, just how, how diabolical infections are in many parts of the world. Both these cases actually exclusively had visual involvement and nothing else to begin with. The second one had myoclonus. The first one only had visual involvement. We thought he's a cannabis abuser, so we thought of RCVS. It turned out to be a head turner. It turned out to be SSP just because of the base, because of certain relevant investigation. So this is the last image, which I have to show you all. I hope I finished in time. That's when we did the INCON, and that's when Professor Kennard and Professor Gordon Plant were kind enough to come and visit our institute Thank you so much for your audience and thank you so much for encouraging. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Vivek. That's excellent. A uh, couple of fascinating cases. It's uh, one of those neurological phenomena which, if you don't think of, you, uh, you won't diagnose. And I've seen a number of cases that have been missed, uh, a bit like Marcinia Gravis, which, if you don't think about it, often gets missed. Now, we've got a, we've got a few questions. There's an interesting one here, which I also was uh, uh, interesting. Uh, what is the mechanism of the retina to occipital progression of the visual tract's involvement? Were the retinal necrosis and occipital MRI changes synchronous or sequential? I think there is a case of postulation of axoplasmic spread of the virus distally to LGB and occipital lobe. So what, what do you think the mechanism is I, to have I, all that of all, in I, the I, first I, case? Thank you so much, Professor Kennard, for that question. And Sunil, I'm seeing you. I'm seeing your name. Sunil, I think it is axonal spread. And both the, uh, both the retinal and the occipital uh, changes were synchronous. So the, the, the MRI was done when this patient came to us with retinal necrosis. But it was synchronous. However, there is a distinct possibility that you may have occipital involvement before retinal involvement. We have seen a few patients presenting only with cortical visual loss when the anterior visual pathways were uninvolved. Great. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, that must be uh, an explanation. So, uh, Sunil also says in the second case, slightly atypical EEG runs of high voltage, slow wave periodically, but well described. Well, that's yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's. Uh, what are so somebody's asked what are the immunological tests available for cryon and anything new from the treatment point of view? So, I mean, I mean now we all know. Um, can I answer that question, sir? Yep. Cryon is it's it, it, cryon. Most of the cases of cryon these days have been found in recent studies to have an anti mog syndrome. They have anti mog antibodies, but then you have a few patients who actually do are negative for antibodies. So I don't think this fits into that cryon definition because cryon is chronic recurrent inflammatory optic neuropathy. Understand the retina is flared. Here the retina is also being savaged by the illness. Right, right. Somebody suggested uh, would one consider methyl uh, alcohol in the first case? Uh, uh, we thought of that. Exactly. We thought of that. He was a cannabis abuser. So we thought it may be methyl alcohol poisoning, but please remember again, methyl alcohol ravages the optic nerve. It, it is the fastest cause of optic atrophy. I mean, you if you have methyl alcohol poisoning within 48 hours, your optic nerves are gone, but the right. retina is yeah. spared. Yeah. You know, uh, within 48 hours, the optic nerve is gone. Right. So uh, somebody suggested, I'm, I'm not sure what it is, VKH. Uh, no, I, I don't think they switch into that. No, and, uh, know, we, we, um, it's a tongue twister. Uh, so I'll, I'll put it as VKH. No, I don't think it fits into that. So. Right. Um, hang on, there's another one. Uh, what do? You, what is it? Is your feeling on the entity of neuroretinitis? Can your first case, though without a macular scar, can be called a type of neuroretinitis? 
difficult to answer difficult to answer the important thing here is if it's a neuroretinitis please remember it is optic nerve with the retina here the optic nerve was spared you know that's that's and then of course you have cat scratch disease you have sarcoidosis you have other causes of neuroretinitis here yeah. the situation was so grim that the, the 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 retina had been completely obliterated now that is something you don't get in neuroretinitis you get inflammation and edema of the retina in neuroretinitis not such savage destruction in neuroretinitis right and then i think a couple of people of uh, i think there's a last question about uh, treatments for sspe and for particularly for acute liquid uh, liquefactive uh, necrosis of the retina are there any treatments unfortunately uh, sir unfortunately the situation is very grim i mean we can right. say that yep. drugs, but the fact is the bottom line is there is no definite treatment other than prevention measles vaccination that's imperative unfortunately in some parts of the world measles vaccination is now being associated with attention deficit disorders in adults so people are weaning themselves away from measles vaccination i think this is a message that if you go away from measles vaccination this is going to increase right right okay well i think we better draw that uh, your case to a, cases to a close so thank you very much vivek fascinating cases my pleasure sir thank you so much and then the last uh, case from Rajid Soman is, uh, are you there? Let's just see. <coughs> yeah, here I am. Rajiv is yep. there. Hi, hi. Very good. So um, a, a case of infection in an immunocompromised host. So Dr. Soman, over to you. Hi, I'm a man out here, I'm not a biologist, I'm an ID physician, and I have chosen to title my presentation, The Sugar Coated Meast. So the, this is a 62-year-old lady who referred for an ID opinion, and these were the notes in her case sheet. On December 1st, 2018, she had headache and low mood due to the death of her husband. Some antidepressants were started. Three weeks later, a plain MRI was done, which showed a partial left sigmoid sinus thrombosis and warfarin was started. December 25th, her clinical condition, including mental changes, worsened markedly, and a MRI with contrast was done. This time it showed leptomeningeal enhancement as well as cerebritis. Along with cerebral cellular infarction, cerebritis, microbleed in pons, the CSF had shown lymphatic diosis. And that is when the patient was referred for an ID opinion. On first being approached, the patient was found to be totally unresponsive. There were no relatives available at all, and no further history apart from what was there in the case sheet could be obtained. So what went on in our is this seems to be the most likely condition here is could it be TB meningitis or cryptococcal meningitis? Could it be viral meningoencephalitis or could it be some none of these above? So TBM, we can definitely get a combination of leptomeningitis and infarction due to vasculitis. So it, that is suggestive subpile involvement is also possible, although the progress of this illness has been a bit too slow. What about cryptococcal meningitis? It is less likely in an apparently normal host, less likely to have vasculitic infarction. 20% of non-HIV infected patients with cryptococcal meningitis have no apparent risk factors, although some may have autoantibodies to cytokines or to the GM CSF. What about viral meningoencephalitis? This illness had started with progressive headache and not started with gross mental changes. So TB seemed to be on our mind. Now relatable and the review of history showed that ulcerative colitis had been diagnosed in 2014, four years ago. And the patient was on mesacol as well as on azathioprine. She had a flare and was on cytosine, which was slowly tapered, but increased again in November 2018. And December was when her problem started. Headache started on December 1st was very severe. That is an important part of the history which came up and was progressively increasing. 
And after the first MRI, which had not shown any marks on the immunosuppressive therapy was stopped. The other was had followed, as was told to us by the patients. So now what do we think is most likely? Could it be still TBM as the most likely possibility, or could it be now cryptococcal? Is it going up in our differential diagnosis or anything else? So TBM might still be the most likely possibility, even though the patient now we know is severely immunocompromised, not severely, but clearly is severe uh, immunocompromised. But others also need to be considered, such as to meningitis and listeria in view of immunosuppressive medication. What about cryptococcal meningitis? Serious condition is possible. An infarction could be due to an inflammatory response after an abrupt immunosuppressive withdrawal. Vasculitis and infarction is actually much more common in non-HIV infected patients with cryptococcal meningitis. It is far, far less important in HIV associated cryptococcal meningitis. And the polysaccharide capsule actually is the one which is having a composite immune system. And that's why I chose to uh, call this presentation as a sugar coolness. Virus is not specifically common with this immunosuppressive regimen. And also brainstem, cerebritis, immunocompromised status, meningitis makes this certainly possible. So the test. A new CSF, which was a test on it, which is the multiplex PCR, which was positive for Cryptococcus neoformat. The expert MD did not show TB. The patient was started on liposomal amphotericin B plus 5 flu cytosine. CSF drainage was done, and there was absolutely no improvement in consciousness for the next four days. So the question in our mind is, are we just happy with this information that we have got, or is there something more to be understood in this patient? So do we need an India Inc. preparation in this patient who's already got a, a PCR positive? Do we need a culture as well as susceptibility? Do we need a crack jitter? So the answer is probably yes, we need all these things in addition because of certain reasons. So we need to see how important inflammation versus the organism in this particular case. So the India Inc. was negative, which probably tells us that the organism burden is not too much. And that was also reflected in the CSF uh, cryptococcal titer, which was only one in 50. All this indicated low burden. So the organism, the problem at hand was more likely due to severe inflammation and which was brought on because of an abrupt withdrawal of the immunosuppression. We had this susceptibility pattern. We showed that fluconazole MIC was eight. So actually, we did restart this patient on cyclosporine and steroids, and the patient started improving over the next day. Culture grew after two weeks, and the MIC was eight. And you will notice here that there is no interpretation app appended here to this report. So we started on liposomal amphotericin B plus 5 flu cytosine. So what? continued as induction therapy in this particular patient. Would it be deoxycholate plus 5 flu cycle per week or the same should be continued for 6 weeks or we should use liposomal amphotericin B plus caspofungin for 3 weeks? So that was a question which we address now. So this regimen of deoxycholate plus 5 flu cytosine for 2 weeks is the preferred regimen in HIV infected patients on the basis of various RCTs. And what we need to remember is, is that this treatment is at least the induction treatment for at least two weeks. So it will be the liposomal amphotericin B plus cytosine for six weeks be preferred in this patient who is a non-transplant patient. However, we must remember here there is no full consensus about the management as well as the duration, because these guidelines have been based on studies which were published before the availability of all these products, as well as the concept of induction, consolidation, and maintenance as treatment for cryptococcal meningitis. Besides, it's based on data that are limited, retrospective, and extrapolated. This population, which is non-HIV and non-transplant, is a very heterogeneous population, and that ranges from apparently normal hosts, although we are finding some subtle immunological abnormalities there, 
and or to those who have malignancies and liver disease. Obviously, Casco fungi has no place whatsoever in the management of any cryptococcal disease. And uh, uh, besides, they do not penetrate CSF well at all. What about none of the above? And there is this new study called as the ACTA study, which was done in HIV infected patients in Africa and re other resources, mainly in Africa. And where they found that amphotericin B plus 5 flu cytosine for just one week resulted in the least all cause mortality. But what was the all cause mortality? The least mortality about 25%. So this has informed the WH guidelines of 2018 to use this kind of a regimen for one week in resource-limited patients in HIV-infected patients. Now, just look at this. Uh, represent the trade-off between clearance of infection versus adverse drug reactions and nosocomial sepsis in resource-limited patients. If you have a setting like this where it is not possible to monitor therapy well, not do the electrolytes or isolinia, have meticulous uh, infection control practices, then it is going to be a problem. So the sooner you stop your intravenous treatment or an induction treatment, the better it is. However, this short regimen may not be applicable if you can manage the toxicities of this regimen. You can manage the infection control practices properly so that you won't get nosocomial sepsis in a short time then it is probably not applicable. Neither is it applicable for non-HIV patients and for those with parenchymal disease. So we did continue the liposomal amphotericin B plus 5 flu cytosin with a plan to continue that for six weeks. Subsequent CSF cultures were negative. Unfortunately, she developed a peripheral neuropathy after three weeks due to 5 flu cytosin and we switched to a high dose fluconazole. That brings me to the question of what does it mean and the MIC of fluconazole is A. So we must remember here that there are no official clinical breakpoints for cryptococcus and fluconazole. Because it is very difficult to say what does cure, what, what sort of cure rates would, would you get when the MIC is 8 or when it is 16 and something like that. So what we really have are only epidemiological cutoffs for the cryptococcus and fluconazole. So clinical breakpoints such as more than 16 are indicated in the IDS guidelines. Or better still, if we have the isolate before and the isolate later, and the MIC has increased three times in the patient, we would be a better to know whether there is resistance. And I think there is an uh, important authority in Spain who would say that even the MIC of two should be considered as somewhat resistant. There are lots of issues about antifungal testing because the, the drug testing in vivo can be missed by lab testing because there is annular which occurs during the The thing that you measure in vivo may not reflect all the conditions in vivo. Resistance has been found to be 12% overall and 24% isolates. So the, additionally, the sequence where the organism has uh, mutations in the isol target or in the efflux pumps genes. So these are things which we actually did in this particular patient. This patient continued with liposomal amphotericin B plus fluconazole for further three weeks. The consolidation phase was advised with a somewhat higher dose of fluconazole followed by a maintenance phase for six to 12 months as has been advised in non-HIV non-transplant patients. So in summary, uh, we need to pay a lot of attention to the onset, duration, and progress, which will guide us to the etiology. Besides, local epidemiology is very important. We have, everyone has to keep TB at the top of the differential diagnosis. Most characteristics, including the exact type of immunocompromise, is also an important. And all these three or four factors help be higher differential diagnosis. Which of Aging or characteristics will be added. The role of the immune system in cocal disease called, is what everyone appreciates. But even the expression of the disease, progression of the disease, and recovery is all very important, and the role of immune system is extremely important. 
all possible probiologic information is necessary. So we do need to see, look at the susceptibility pattern and what it really means in order to fashion treatment. It's very important that your induction treatment will get over soon. After that, you are completely dependent upon the good efficacy of fluconazole. And if there was some resistance to fluconazole, we really need to think how to manage the patients further during their consolidation and um, maintenance phase. So treatment, fine, the plan of treatment finally depends definitely on the guidelines, but also depends on the host characteristics, the disease manifestations, including iris or paradoxical responses, the MIC of the organism, intolerance to drugs, as well as interactions which the patient may face when additional drugs are being given, the expense, finally the clinical response. With this, I'll stop, and if there are any questions, uh, I'll be happy to Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. That was a very interesting case. Uh, I didn't quite get what, what was the outcome of the patient? I mean, yes, she, she did well and she's following up. She's only in maintenance phase now. Right, right. Okay. So, have we got any uh, questions here? Let me just see. Uh, I don't think we've got any specific questions that anybody's written down. Um, and I think we've sort of come to the, with our slightly uh, delayed start, I think we've come to the end of our two hours. So uh, can I thank all the, the speakers of the short cases very much? And of course, Dr. Med Professor Medina. Uh, Chandra, do you want to have the last word? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, we had a very interesting uh, session and I would like to thank uh, Professor Marco Medina, Professor John England, Professor Chris Krena and uh, for presentation, uh, Professor Anita, Professor Vivek and Professor Raju Soman. Next week, uh, same time we meet and uh, uh, Dr. Riyadh will speak on neurobrisulosis. And he will show the whole spectrum of neurobrisulosis from brain to spinal cord and uh, different things. And the session will be chaired by Professor Gulfeng Risard, who is the secretary of WFN, and uh, uh, Professor Hadi Manji from London. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Hadi Manji and uh, Professor Raj Shakir for being with us here. And uh, also thank uh, Dr. Gagandeep uh, Rahul Kulkarni for moderators. Uh, for case presentation, please write to either me or uh, Dr. Rahul Kulkarni and Gagandeep. So we can have those who are interested in presenting cases, uh, they should submit the cases. And uh, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Yeah, the Professor. Professor Rad would like to make some comments. Uh, whom are you talking of, sir? I can get it. No, I just saw no, Professor Rad Shakir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. <laughs> Marco, great talk and uh, great cases. And uh, next week, same time uh, at 7 p.m. India Standard Time, we'll have a session four of this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Great session. Good night.